Leviticus 23, 9 through 14. Let's hear God's word. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord, so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, a year old, without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord. And a grain offering with it shall be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma, and a drink offering with it shall be of wine a fourth of a hin. And you shall neither eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until this same day, until you have brought the offering of your God. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So the feasts and festivals of the Old Testament are not exactly the most riveting reading of the Bible or the most exciting. But each one has its own way of pointing ahead to who Jesus is and what He is about. And so this one, the Feast of the First Fruits, has some special significance for us on Easter. On uh, the screen here, there's, there's a calendar, a Jewish calendar with uh, the different festivals that they, they observed, and uh, the first fruits is uh, really close to Passover and unleavened bread. We talked about Passover just last week. The first fruits comes just after that, and um, this, is the one, this is the one that really points to Christ and His resurrection. So the Feast of the First Fruits, let's look at that for a minute. In verse 10, it said, You shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. Okay, so the people were to bring to the Lord their first batch of the harvest. So their first batch, when they're harvesting their crops, what they're growing, that first batch they're supposed to bring before the Lord to the temple, and they are supposed to offer that to the Lord to recognize what God has done for them. And the first is not just the first, but it's also considered the best. And in particular, the Hebrew word for first kind of basically means the chief or the top, the, the best, if you will. And so, like in Amos 6, verse 6, it says, anoint themselves with the finest oils. It's the, it's the best you have. And so, likewise, these, these Israelites, they were supposed to bring God their best. Not what's left over, not just what they're not going to use, but their first and their best. And so, the best batch is what they're supposed to offer to the Lord. We give, we give God our best, not our worst, not our leftovers. We give God our best. And it says in verse 11, that the priest would wave or hold up the sheaf for their acceptance. So this this notion of wave, it's called a wave offering. I I tried to figure out what that exactly looked like. I had a really difficult time finding it, but the one thing that I did find is that waving can also mean just holding up. That they would take the priest would take the grain And it would be held up before the Lord as an offering. As in, Lord, this belongs to you. This is is your servant, farmer, so-and-so. And and this is is his first batch of the harvest. And this is for you. And so we offer it to you today. So it would be held up before the Lord. An elevation offering, if you will. And in verse 11, it says that this was done on the day after the Sabbath. Now, if you know Jewish calendars, Sabbath means Saturday. The day after Saturday is Sunday. So this happened on a Sunday. This is when this would be done. You celebrate the first fruits to offer this to God on 
that Sunday. In Deuteronomy, it talks about this festival a little bit more, and it connects it with the Israelites leaving Egypt during that exodus. So it says there, with this offering, they had to recount their deliverance from Egypt. So it says there, And you shall make response before the Lord your God. A wandering Aramean was my father, and he went down into Egypt and sojourned there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. And the Egyptians treated us harshly and humiliated us and laid on us hard labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and saw our affliction, our toil, and our oppression. And the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great deeds of terror, with signs and wonders. And he brought us into this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And behold, now I bring the first of the fruit of the ground which you, O Lord, have given me. And you shall set it down before the Lord your God and worship the Lord your God. So, this is what they were supposed to say when they came and brought the offering. There's this long, long recounting of what happened in Egypt. And in giving these first fruits, they symbolically gave their whole harvest to the Lord. By giving their first and their best, they symbolically gave the whole harvest to the Lord. I mean, obviously, they, they needed to eat. But if you give God your first and your best, this was supposed to symbolize giving over the whole harvest to the Lord. And so this is what, this is what that was supposed to mean. Everything belongs to the Lord. Everything comes from God, and everything that we have is a gift of God. And so we give our first and our best, so that we recognize that and we can offer that to the Lord. And one more thing, they, in giving these first fruits, that first batch, they had to trust that God would provide the rest of the harvest. They had to trust that by giving what they had at first, that the rest would come, and it would come well. And that... That's a big deal, especially when you don't have a big transportation system around where if your crop fails, or the rest of your crop fails, or if a hailstorm comes tomorrow and it's gone, that you can't just have food shipped from another state and your grocery stores will be full. I mean, everybody there depended on what they grew to eat and to survive. And so this was a major act of trust for them to give God your first and your best and to have to simply just trust that the rest would be there when you needed it. So this wasn't just an offering. This was also an act of faith. And that needs to be, that needs to be highlighted as well. Let's look, at the, uh, let's look at the screen and let's answer this question together. How does Christ's resurrection benefit us? First, by his resurrection, he has overcome death so that he might make us share in the righteousness he won for us by his death. Second, by his power, we too are already now resurrected to a new life. Third, Christ's resurrection is a guarantee of our glorious resurrection. It's a guarantee of it. So all of this, this festival here that might seem a little dry and just detailed regulations and stuff, this points to Christ. This is not just an empty festival or a meaningless ritual that they had to go through that we don't have to go through anymore. This meant something. It was pointing ahead to Jesus Jesus is the first fruits of resurrection. He is the first fruits. Paul says that exactly in 1 Corinthians 15. In fact, 
Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, that is, passed away. For as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Christ is the first fruits of the rex- resurrection. So Jesus is the first of the coming resurrection. He is the first one to rise. Nobody else had risen like he did before. There were a couple resurrection miracles that Jesus performed, like with Lazarus or that widow's son or Jairus's daughter. But those people, those people still died eventually. They were, still, they were still mortal, and they still had perishable bodies. But when Christ arose, he rose with a glorious body. His body is not going to die again. It's not going to get sick. It can do amazing things. In the story that we read just a moment ago of the resurrection, when the women got to the tomb and that angel rolled that stone away, The angel didn't roll the stone away so that Christ could get out. He was already gone. The stone was rolled away so that the women could come in and see that he was gone. Jesus walked through that stone. This is a different sort of a body that can do amazing things. And one day... We will have bodies like this. Jesus is the first of the coming resurrection. Jesus is the best of the coming resurrection too. Nobody else was as righteous as he was. No one else was worthy like he was before. Nobody else has the divinity of him. Jesus is fully human and fully divine. So he is the best person to ever walk this earth. And so he is not only the first one to rise, but he is the best one to rise too. And Jesus, being the first fruits, he was held up. He was held up on the cross so that we would be accepted. It says in of this first fruits offering that the priest will hold it up for the acceptance. It was held up so that we would be accepted. And Christ, similarly, was held up on a cross so that we would be accepted. He is an offering that makes us acceptable to God. So He was held up on the cross And Jesus became the first fruits of the resurrection on the first day of the week, on Sunday, the day after the Sabbath, what we sometimes refer to now as the Lord's Day. This is why we worship every Sunday, not just once every Easter, but every Sunday, because Jesus redefined the whole week when he rose again on Easter, so that we don't worship on Saturday anymore. We worship on Sunday, the Lord's Day, the day that He arose, the first day of the week, so that we, in turn, offer the first fruits of our time every week to the Lord. So Jesus became the first fruits of the resurrection. I'm going to lay this right here so that you will see and remember that these first fruits are of the resurrection, and Jesus is that first fruits of the resurrection. So, for them, in giving the first fruits, they gave the whole harvest to God. Christ, as the first fruits, makes the whole batch holy also. And Paul says this exactly too. Romans 11:16. He talks about dough being offered as first fruits. If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, 
so are the branches. So if Jesus is the first fruits of the harvest of resurrection, he, being holy, makes the whole batch holy, so that everyone who belongs to him and believes in him is holy like he is. If you belong to Jesus Christ, you are holy, you are sacred to God. You stand before the Lord like Jesus does, clothed with his righteousness, so to speak. So we can actually stand before God with all the good things that he has done. We're not, we're not these awful people anymore who have done all of these terrible things and turned away from God in awful ways. We, we stand before God with the righteousness of Christ, sinless as if I had never sinned nor been a sinner, as it says. In giving the first fruits, the Israelites had to trust that God would provide for the rest of the harvest. They had to put their their faith in Him for that, that He would provide. But this is where it gets a little bit different. With Christ as first fruits, we do not merely hope, but we have a guarantee of the resurrection. Like we said just a moment ago, Christ's resurrection is a guarantee of our glorious resurrection. It's not, well, we just hope it'll happen. It's going to happen. We have a guarantee. We have an example already. This is what is going to happen. So, in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 14, it says, He who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus, and bring us with you into his presence. This is going to happen. It's not, well, we hope it happens. It's going to. The Lord did it once, and he's going to do it again with all of us on that last day when Jesus comes again. So, this is all nice. This is a nice picture that we have here, First Fruits Festival pointing ahead to, to Jesus and everything. There's some things that this means for us, though, too. In being a Christian, in following Jesus, following Jesus means offering ourselves as first fruits, that we give ourselves to the Lord. In Romans 12, verse 1, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. We are holy, we are acceptable to God, and we offer ourselves, our lives, our bodies, as first fruits, as an offering to the Lord, too. So, do we give... To God, part of our life or all of it? Do we give God our first and our best or just what's left over? In God's economy, according to the way that Jesus lived and died and rose, we gain by giving. Jesus gave his life and he gained a resurrection. Likewise, when we give our lives as a living sacrifice, we gain a resurrection. You gain by sacrifice. You live by dying to yourself and you receive by giving. This is backwards to our normal way of thinking. You don't get by giving. That, that's not how it works. You don't live by dying. That doesn't make any sense, right? But Jesus lived his whole life this way. And if you follow him, then you live in a way that really doesn't make sense. That's kind of counterintuitive to our normal way of thinking. You live by dying to yourself. In offering their first fruits, the Israelites recounted their deliverance from Egypt. 
By offering ourselves as living sacrifices, with this offering we recount deliverance from sin and death. So, by giving our lives to the Lord, we recount, we recall, we point to what Jesus has done for us. In James 1.18, Of His own will He brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of His creatures. So, He brought us forth by the word of truth so that we might be that kind of first fruits offering of all of His creatures. And so, we give ourselves as the first fruits offering. This is our lives. Those in Christ have died and risen with Him. If you belong to Jesus and you know Him as Lord and Savior, that means that, spiritually speaking, you've already died, been crucified with Him, and spiritually, you've already been raised with Him from the dead. And it says this a number of times in the New Testament. Ephesians 2, 4-6. through 6, But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with Him, and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we died with Him, we rose with Him, and now we are seated in the heavenly places with Him. If you belong to Christ, and you are part of the body of Christ, as it says, then all of what Jesus went through is what you have spiritually gone through already. His story is your story. So you have died already and risen with Him already. So, because of that, already having new life in Christ, live the new life and not the old. You have a new life. You've already died. You've already risen with Christ. You are already seated at the Father's right hand in heaven spiritually and now live this new life that you have, not the old one. Live a new life. Don't live for your own ambitions or passions or pleasures or pride or glory or recognition, popularity, whatever. Don't live for that stuff. That's a waste of time, really. Live, a, live this new life that you have. Colossians 3, 1 through 4. If then you have been raised with Christ, if you have been raised with Christ, then seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. And he goes on there, explaining what that looks like. So put to death, it says, all of these selfish ambitions and such that you have before. Live this new life. With a guaranteed resurrection, which we have because Jesus already rose again, our usual worries and goals become really small. The things that we usually worry about and the things that we're usually going after, in light of a guaranteed resurrection, these things become really small. Almost to the point of who cares? This, this life that we're in now is just a layover to our real destination. This is just, this is just a brief moment. If you have a, a short layover at an airport... Before you reach your destination, this is, this is not your vacation yet. You have the huge vacation yet coming. This is a pit stop. This is not the destination. And it's so easy to get caught up in the idea that we only have so many years to live. And so we better live life to the fullest now. But if you belong to Christ, you've already died. You've already risen. You've already are seated with Him, you are going to live forever. You're going to rise again.
I haven't seen the Grand Canyon yet. That's one thing that I, when I think about it, I think that, that'd be cool to see before I die, you know? This, this is something, you know, I've seen the pictures of it and everything, and it's, wow, if you, I'm sure that the pictures don't do justice to it. So actually standing there and actually seeing this, this massive canyon that's there, that, that would be really cool, you know? So, you know, when I think of things I want to see before I die, that's, that's usually the first one that comes to mind. I don't know what your Grand Canyon is, but look at it this way. You have an eternity to see the Grand Canyon. You have an eternity to see that. But you only have a limited time to live for Christ, to witness for Him, to show His love to people in need. We have forever to achieve the things that we want to achieve and those goals that we normally have. We have forever to do that. But we only have a limited time to bear witness to Jesus. So, use this time wisely. Use this limited time to prepare for eternity. This is not the end. This is only the beginning. Christ has been raised. We are going to be raised too. So you and I, we, we prepare for things like adulthood. I mean, we're thinking ahead to, to jobs and settling down and all this kind of stuff. We prepare for adulthood. We prepare for retirement. I mean, you think about the saving and the things that you want to do. We, we prepare for that. It's not something you can just waltz right into. You have to think ahead about that. We even prepare for things like fires and tornadoes. Things that only might happen. Why don't you prepare for something that is definitely going to happen, that is guaranteed to happen, and that is your resurrection. One day, wherever they bury you, your body is going to rise from that grave. And that includes if you are drowned at sea and lost there, and you're eaten by sharks or something like that, one day God is going to take the pieces of your body, He's going to put them back together, and your body is going to rise again just like Christ did, and you are going to never die again. Prepare for resurrection and eternity, because this is certain. If you prepare for fire and you get things like insurance to cover you in case things might happen, then why not prepare for something that is definitely going to happen? Simply put, we prepare by living like Jesus and telling about Him, talking about Him. This is how you prepare. Live like life like He did. And don't just do that, but actually talk about Him. If the Lions win the Super Bowl, I mean, I know a lot of you are Lions fans out there, that'd be pretty exciting, wouldn't it? They've never won a Super Bowl. And if they actually did, as unbelievable as it might seem sometimes, that would be awesome. Wouldn't you go talk about it with everybody? That's just a sports team. Jesus rose from the dead and conquered death forever. He overcame all of these things that weigh upon us. Why wouldn't you talk about that? Why, why are we ashamed about that? Why are we shy about that? This is, this is the best news that the world has ever known. So speak truth. Share the good news. Show love to the undeserving. This is how Jesus lived. Jesus, on that night he was betrayed, washed all of his disciples' feet. That includes Judas Iscariot, the one who was just about to betray him. Would you be able to wash the feet of somebody who was going to betray you into death? This is how Jesus lived. But if you're going to rise again, these other things, they don't matter as much. 
If, you, if we die now, we're going to rise again. We can show love to our enemies, even the ones that are going to kill us. Have compassion on those in need. Know Jesus, live like him, talk about him. Jesus is the first fruits of resurrection. He is the first fruits of that. And because of that, we are guaranteed a resurrection. So prepare to rise again because it's going to happen. This is going to happen. Let's prepare. Let's live like Jesus. Let's talk about him. Let's share this best news that this world has ever known. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord our God, it's an amazing thing that death has been defeated and that we, as difficult as it might be to imagine, are going to rise again someday. Lord, help us to take this good news to heart and to actually live like Jesus, to follow him and to talk about him, to share this good news that life doesn't end, it continues on, and to embrace Jesus as Lord and Savior. And we pray all things in Jesus' name. Amen.